Right, good afternoon. Uh, April 5th today. Friday. Finally, it's Friday. Um, yeah, it is Friday. See, it says Friday. Uh, okay, so um, this is uh, what, three days before the sun eclipse that we're going to experience. Uh, so just a uh, you know, historical remark uh, uh, you know, for somebody who's going to watch this video maybe five years from now. Eh? <laughs> All right. Um, okay, let's start. This was the last slide from the previous uh, presentation, which is the second part. We're going to talk about some of the site work, terminology and procedures. Okay. Um, mm, 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 mm. Control L. Is right or not? Control L is going to give us the. Uh, I did press control L on the others in the other screen I can I hope that you can still hear me and see me I hope that it didn't trigger anything uh, all right so site work we're good okay we're good uh, cool so remember when I was talking to you about billing in stages we got to bill the client in stages to protect yourself because uh, quite often not quite often but once in a while, um, the company that hires you, that hands out the contract and, uh, you know, and, and they pay upon the completion of the job, uh, sometimes it happens um, that the company goes bankrupt. Uh, you know, they go out of business or something like that. So they file for bankruptcy. And then you're stuck with all the materials that you have paid for and all the time and money invested in the whole job. And uh, you, know, you, you take the hit, you take the loss. So bill in stages. All right. So first, uh, remember, we talked about delivering the equipment on site. You spend the, well, you, you use your good relationship with the distributor when you establish the line of credit. Um, then you can get a lot uh, of equipment. Uh, you know, you can get big projects uh, and you know, deliver that thing on site and get the check right away. And this this way you can uh, you can get a lot of equipment for a lot of money, and then you take that check and you deposit in your bank, and right away you transfer that to the distributor where you got the equipment from. And there you go. And uh, you know if you make a mark, uh, you know a little bit of a markup, then you already made some money, and rightfully you should because you already invested some time. You know this this whole thing doesn't happen by itself. So don't feel guilty about uh, earning money for the job that you do. Uh, all right, so. <clears throat> Now, the next tangible stage, um, I would say tangible, well, in a way that uh, it's doable, it's uh, measurable in some sort of way, uh, is the rough-in stage. And I put it with a hyphen, rough-in stage. Roughing in, roughing wires in. What is the, um, uh, what does that mean? Oh, you get the wires, and you rough them in. Yeah, okay, there you go. Next slide, no, just kidding. Uh, Usually what you do is you uh, pull the wires from the central location where it would popularly be called a home run location and usually it would be a land roam right? unless it's some kind of a intermediate uh, point, distribution point of the wires. Uh, and then you pull them to the location. So let's say here is a room that is going to require some wires, you know, maybe a few jacks there, da, 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 da. You just bring those wires to that room above the ceiling and coil them up. Sometimes if, uh, you know, if it makes sense and if it's easy enough, you can run those wires down the wall. But usually it's just you bring them to the location and you call them up, you know, in the ceiling. And then there's going to be another room here that will require, we will, will require some other wires. You pull them down. You just pull the wires and bring them to location and coil them up in the ceiling. It's called a rough end stage. And of course, you cut them to length on the other side and you uh, sometimes you leave them on the floor. And if you can lock the land room so nobody walks in and steps on your wires, uh, if you can do that, that's great. Sometimes uh, you can put those uh, big bundles in, you know, some sort of protective boxes. Sometimes uh, you can uh, do a little bit of a, you know, a couple of two or three posts uh, with the caution tape and just tape it around uh, just so people don't walk in that area. Point is that nobody touches the wires, nobody 
taps on those wires because uh, yeah, that can damage the structural in that, that can affect the uh, structural integrity of the wires, which means uh, it can uh, uh, alter the specifications of the wire. So all of a sudden, you don't have CAT six; you have CAT five E, right? um, and the client paid for CAT five six. Sorry, CAT five six. <laughs> All right, it's Friday. Cut six. There's no cut five six. Cut six or cut five e. All right. uh, now, um, what did I say here? After planning the cable distribution, the rough in stage begins. So you know, you did all the survey, you did all the quote, and uh, you have allocated uh, which wire goes to what place, and maybe you uh, came up with some sort of a numbering scheme that uh, that you could put on the drawings uh, for the people who are going to be doing that stuff. As much information as you can get them to make their life easier, then the the situation becomes as such that. Uh, uh, that the job is being done smooth in a smooth way, uh, and that's uh, if if you're the project coordinator, that would be your job to make sure that this thing happens. Right? And you have to watch out, watch uh, for things like you know, the, is there any extra equipment that people need? Is there any PPE that would they need? Uh, do they have enough uh, bits and pieces to do the job so uh, there's no any uh, standstills? Right? Uh, all right, all cables in that rough-in stage, uh, and this is billable stage after all the wires are roughed in bang another stage build a client build a client as much as you can well as much as you can uh, as it makes sense uh, in stages so if it happens that somebody goes bankrupt you are not um, you know you, you haven't lost all the money you just maybe lost uh, part of it or maybe nothing because uh, it, it gets to the point that you haven't done the job, uh, the, the, the billable stage, next billable stage. Yeah? All right, so in this uh, rough in stage, all cables are pulled from uh, the home run location to their destinations. The cables are coiled in bundles at both ends, but not terminated. Make sure that all the cables are clearly identified at both ends. And that I remember when I was, uh, when we were. Uh, uh, really on your case on numbering the wires uh, that was a patch panel lab that we did uh, we were practicing labeling the cables at both ends let that stay in you all right uh, all runs are securely mounted in the ceiling space or otherwise raceways and the work is done according to the local and building electrical code uh, now when it comes to oh, move the mouse too much Oh, come on. Let's get this. Press the key. All right. Cable installation begins with establishing pathways. So, um, electrical or data infrastructure, which is, you know, be the wiring, um, and some equipment as well. Uh, it begins with installing or first uh, establishing the pathways and then installing the well, installing the physical pathways for the cable, which we, we call we, we call raceways. Right? So sometimes you're going to be installing the pipes, bending pipes, mounting to the walls, to the ceiling and whatnot. Uh, and sometimes you're going to be assembling wiring, the cable trays, um, or some other means of, uh, of root, wire routing um, ways. Right? Uh, well, Give me a sec here, guys and gals. I'm going to bring up my board. When we're talking about this here, God. there you go, stay there. Yeah, so the building an electrical code. That's what I was talking about. Uh, one important thing when running data wires is the fire rating, uh, fire rating thing. Mm -hmm. Let me just uh, establish a board so I could do some scratch marks here. New file. Okay, file. New. Yeah, that will do. Okay. All right. 
There is my whiteboard. Let me get my pen. Okay. Uh, now, there's something that you're going to hear a lot. It's going to be F T four rating and F T six. This here F T four is non fire rated. FT6 is fire rated cable. What does it what does it mean? All right, there is no difference in the copper conductors. There's no difference in twist, there is no difference in type of copper that is being used. There's no difference in anything but the jacketing of the cable. So the specifications are the same. The signal, the way the signal behaves in that wire in both of those categories of the wires, not categories, but uh, the types of wires, uh, there's no difference. The signal flows just the same. The performance is just the same. It's the jacketing that makes the difference. What kind of difference does it mean? All right, FT4 is going to burn and the plastic jacketing is going to produce toxic fumes. FT6 is, well, sort of like non-burning, but of course everything burns if you get, you know, if you're exposed to enough heat and for, you know, but it takes much longer and much harder to burn FT6. So FT6 is considered as fire rated jacketing. Um, where does this come in play? It comes in play like this here. Here's my pan. Here's a room. Here's the floor in the room. So there would be you here with the smiling faces. All right. All right. Here's the ceiling. There's the ceiling tiles, the grid of the ceiling tiles. And here is the true ceiling with uh, something that's called uh, you know, the red bar or T bar or red bar or red iron. Okay, and it looks like this. And over here is the floor of the room above. So here is the ceiling tiles. And here is something that's called a plenum. That's the plenum area. Now, sometimes it is 10 feet high, sometimes it is two feet high, sometimes it is one foot, and sometimes it's barely any space. All right, where does the FT4 and FT6 come from? Well, it has to do with the air circulation. You will have vents in the ceiling. And the vents will be provided with piping that will push the air in to the room. So here's the air that goes this way here. All right, well, in order for air to be circulated, it has to go somewhere. So sometimes you're going to see some sort of vents in the walls, like grids, you know, in the walls. What's behind that, there's going to be another pipe and it's going to, what's behind the wall, going through the ceiling, and that is going to circulate the air, the cold air, because let's say this is, uh, you know, uh, hot air supply. And here is a hot air intake. Sorry, cold air intake, because you know, the hot air is being supplied here, becomes cold, and the cold air is recirculated back to the furnace. So it's a closed system. In this case, you can use FT4 cabling. 
ft4 right. now there could be another system and yes i'm going to use the eraser in this case here okay, let's erase that part and let's have that opening here and that's going to be another ceiling tile and it's just a grid if you shine a flashlight through that upwards you're going to see the true ceiling through that grid it's just a ceiling tile in the form of a grid open grid now <clears throat> somewhere in the plenum is going to be a cavity quite oft quite often it's quite big which is going to have a another air duct another pipe that is going to take the air out so that's the cold air return here the air is being sucked in from the room by the negative pressure caused by this intake so the air is just going to go here and it's going to find itself there right. <clears throat> now this here in this case it is called we're talking about something that we call cold air return cold air return plenum and when we have cold air return plenum any wiring that's in the ceiling that is free air which means it's not enclosed in any piping or, or trays that are enclosed then we need to install ft6 cabling with the ft6 fire rated jacket then we're talking we need to have ft6 cables why because this cold air return plenum can cover more than one room between the rooms you have walls you have doors you know they can enter through and you know they can lock the doors and whatnot but above this area could be covering more than one room and each room is going to have those grids for the cold air return to the main furnace what happens in case of fire in case of fire all the air supply and everything is being shut down the furnace is going to be shut down uh, there's going to be no air circulation however if there is any fire in this room the toxic fumes can travel through these grids to the other rooms that this whole Cold air return. If there's any fire inside this here area, then the toxic fumes can also travel to other rooms. So, because of that, fire rated materials should be used and it's regulated. So, the cabling that we're going to install, free air, which means exposed, has to be FT6 rated. Now, FT6 cable, CAT5 EFT6, costs more money, about three times as much. Sometimes twice as much, sometimes three times as much, depending on the times, as the FT4. So, FT4 is cheaper. Why can't we just produce FT6? Somebody asked from the last class. Good question. The answer is simple, money. Uh, <clears throat> So in this case, we need to have FT6 cabling. And uh, if somebody tries to get the, some, if somebody gets the idea of, yeah, okay, we're going to build a client for FT6, we're going to document that FT6, but you know what, let's pull FT4, nobody's going to know. They will know. <laughs> All right, they will know. Every job is being received by an inspector. And these inspectors, that one of, that's one of the first things that they're going to look for the cabling is it ft4 and ft6 and after a while you're going to develop uh, a sense of you're going to be able to tell just by looking at it 
the wiring in the ceiling and you're going to say i think that looks like ft4 that's not ft6 let's check and you're going to get a ladder get on top and uh read the nomenclature on the table because on the cable because there are prints it's printed and you're going to say oh yeah it's ft4 hey you know what? what's going to happen the inspector is going to tell you to pull the wire out and the contractor is going to tell you pull new wires in so it's just like you're going to have to do the job twice and if it's a smaller project eh, okay you can uh, survive that but if it's a big project uh you're dealing with a bigger problem right. so ft4 and ft6 as far as the building codes all right so that's you know see just that one you know, uh one um, sentence here how many words? One, two, three, okay, one hour, too many. Right? Uh, so that's the idea of uh, this wonderful picture that I just drew. This word, a thousand words, because I, I think I said thousand words. <laughs> all right, there you go. Uh, all right, <clears throat> so move to the next slide. So free air runs, cable installation. Main runs should be kept in bundles and suspended independently of any ceiling structures. Ah, okay. Let's go back to the picture. <laughs> All right. Now, how is it that the ceiling is installed, the ceiling tiles? Well, it is installed by suspending the grid from the true ceiling on steel rods. A lot of them. And it's all leveled and uh, installed, so it's you know, nice and straight. We used to be able, before things were regulated, we used to be able, like, but that was like, okay, long, long, long time ago. We used to be able to just zip tie the wires to this to these rods and just run them there and, you know, to the location and maybe inside the wall to, to the jack in the wall. We can't do that anymore. And it also has to do with fire regulations. Long story short, why? Well, let's say there is a fireman or a firewoman. See if I can. There you go. And uh, here is a big PPE with uh, you know. And they have those things that are uh, like hooks on the stick they look like this something like this all right and they're going to sometimes they will they will have to yeah i know my artistic abilities are just immense um <clears throat> they're going to use those thingies hooks on the stick because sometimes they'll have to bring some of the structure down and if there's anything that is strapped to it to the ceiling structure that they have to bring down it is just going to pose danger on them it's going to be dangerous for them very dangerous right? uh, <laughs> okay um, so for that reason any wiring that is going to be installed in the ceiling it has to have its own suspension independent of the ceiling structure what do we use for that we use things that are called J-hooks. And, oh, I'd say, oh, well, look, I mentioned that, right? What is it? As much as possible, establish straight runs. Why do we need to, straight, to establish straight runs? Well, if we are pulling a bunch of wires from one place to another, and then they're going to be fanned out uh, somewhere else to go to the, uh, the appropriate rooms, certain rooms and locations, then it is just that much easier to pull the whole bundle if it's in a straight line. So that's uh, plus um, it's aesthetically sound, easier to troubleshoot, and uh, well <clears throat> structurally uh, proper. Mouthful. All right. J hooks mounted on the walls or suspended from the ceiling on threaded rods, we're going to talk about that, are the most common in this scenario. We're talking about free air runs. Now, raceway, raceways. As the alternative to the free air, 
method, closed raceways or cable trays are used. All the raceways should be installed before the cables are run. Plus, it's a billable stage. Hint. There's a hint. What will be a lesson without the hints? Position the J-hooks no further than four feet apart to avoid cable sagging. What does that mean? If you have in the ceiling, if you have J-hooks, can we use this? Here. New file. Here, here. If you have a um, bunch of J-hooks in the ceiling, there's a J-hook mounted in the ceiling. Okay. If you run those wires and the magic number is four feet. Four feet. You run a bunch of wires and they're going to have enough support so they are going to be relatively straight. If you have J hooks that are further apart than four feet, they're going to have tendencies to sag. All right. What happens? That produces a great stress right at this point right here. Which means the cables are going to be just like being stepped on. Here and here. Which means there's a chance that the cable can be structurally damaged. Which means that the signal flow could be compromised because of that. <clears throat> All right, so here's this slide here. All right, we'll talk, remember we talked about threaded rods? I want you to be familiar with certain procedures. So we need to know what you have to work with. Remember we used to play Lego with Lego blocks? It was not for your pleasure as a child. It was to get you ready for the workforce. All right? Secret agents are among us. All right. <laughs> and that was their job, to give you Lego blocks so you could be, um, you know, so to make you a future worker out of you. Anyways, it must be Friday. I'm talking too much. <clears throat> threaded rods. It's a rod yeah, that is threaded. <laughs> All right. Now, some of the rods are threaded just on the ends, but for the most part, you're going to find threaded rods threaded all the way through. This gives you the opportunity to cut them to length, whatever lengths you want, and use them in a various way, such as this, for example, to mount all kinds of different equipment, raceways, J-hooks, cabling, whatnot, equipment, you can mount struts in it. We'll talk about what struts are as well. All right. Threaded rods. All right, what is a threaded rod? It's a relatively long rod that is threaded on both ends. The thread might extend along complete length of the rod. Okay. So now you know what threaded rods are. There are different sizes and different diameters of those. Um, next time you visit uh, some sort of a you know, store that sells hardware, most of them will have those threaded rods. And if you don't know where they are, ask your, uh, you know, ask the person who works there, and uh, they'll, they'll show you where threaded. So you can just walk up to it and see what they are. <clears throat> All right. Another thing that is popular thing to deal with is the strut channel right here that's what it looks like that's another picture of that and these are some of the types of the um, struts one of the most popular types is the half slotted channel right here 
which basically looks like this, right there. Right? But we distinguish. Oh, come on. <laughs> Sorry. Zoom, zoom in. All right, with this. Okay, settle down, settle down. This thing's happening by itself right now, by the way. Sorry. All right. We distinguish a solid channel strut punched. Even the program knows it's Friday, yeah. <laughs> half slotted, slotted, and half channel. All right, so what can we do with this? Well, we can mount it, and we can mount things to it. Quite often, oh, I just clicked on that. Quite often, you're going to use something that are nuts on the spring or with the spring. So they're going to, somebody just combine those two words together and they call them a spring nut. Spring nut. Here's the strut channel, which has a cavity of this size, for example. And the spring nut, the nut is a rectangular piece that can be installed. It could be pushed into that channel and then twisted 90 degrees so the longer side can rest on this channel right here. And the spring is going to put outward pressure keeping that thing in. Now, if you use the threaded rod, you can just thread that right in there. And you can hang a threaded rod in there. You can hang all kinds of other equipment using this, these spring nuts. Strut channel. Standardized form of structural system used in construction and electrical industry industries uh, for light structural support, often for supporting wiring, plumbing, or mechanical components, such as air conditioning or ventilation system. So that means you can handle a lot of weight. Right. Is that the next slide after that? Yes, that's a zoomed in kind of a slide. Now, <clears throat> sometimes you're going to have to, you're going to get lengths, like 10 foot lengths, 6 foot lengths of the strut. And you're going to have to cut them to length using different uh, saws or discs, uh, well, mechanical devices. <clears throat> Just so you know, once you download this, click on this, Metal Fume Fever. It's going to explain what that is. What happens is that steel, this, 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 this struts are made of galvanized steel. Or any kind of galvanized steel, when cut, produces toxic fumes. And apparently they're carcinogenic, which means they can cause cancer. So this thing should be used. If you're cutting those, look, somebody's cutting here and that produces heat. Heat produces fumes. If you cut galvanized steel, those fumes are going to be produced. So use that in a well-ventilated area <coughs> and apply appropriate um, um, personal protective equipment so you don't breed those fumes. All right, J-hook, see here, if they are separated further than four feet apart, they will be sagging, and there's going to be too much pressure right in this point on those wires that are on the bottom. And here are the examples of sealing mounted or on the red bar or red iron. Quite often these parts here, that's the red, see those, uh, those structures here, see that? Quite often they're painted red, so that's why uh, you know the nickname of red red iron. Okay. The threaded rods, well, 
can be also mounted on the red iron using different uh, gadgets that are available in different stores. And you can make almost like a Christmas tree type of a thing out of the J-hooks when you have more wires to be pulled. And those can be mounted on both. This is just one side. They could be mounted on both sides as well. There are different sizes. Here's 4-inch J-hook, 3-inch, 2-inch, 1-inch J-hook. Depending on the size of the J-hooks, they are rated for handling, being able to handle so many wires. And uh, you can sometimes uh, actually see the rating. This can handle so-and-so number of Cat5 E-wires. Um, and so on. Because they're, they're Now, some of them are made out of metal. Some of them are made out of plastic. Some of them are mounted on threaded rods. Some of them are mounted on the walls. Some of them are designed to be mounted straight to the ceiling. Depending on the situation, you're going to choose the appropriate equipment for your use, which means survey and planning and quoting. Uh, those decisions are being made on that level. Or sometimes there's something not unex unexpected, then you have to buy some more uh, of whatever the uh, bits and pieces you need to do the job. All right, so these are the J-hooks. Here's another way they can be, um, J-hook also can be mounted in the ceiling. What do we need? What do we use to mount things in the ceiling? There are a few different ways to mount things. Some of the more popular ones I'm going to introduce to you right now. Here is something that's called a threaded rod hanger. You screw that into the concrete. And you screw the threaded rod into it. Okay. That's why it's called threaded rod hanger. Sometimes we can encounter different problems. See the difference between these two types of ceiling? Here's a bare naked ceiling. This one is covered with perforated steel. Not my favorite, this one here. Because in order to get to the concrete, you drill the hole in the concrete, you need a concrete drill bit and a hammer action on the drill. But you can't use that concrete bit and a hammer action on the steel. So you're going to have to puncture the steel first using a regular kind of a drill bit. Once you get through that, you're going to hit the concrete and you're going to doll up the... you're going to make the bit dull. So you're going to go through a lot of drill bits when it comes to that. Comes to that. <clears throat> Now, often with this ceiling might be sprayed with something that's called, well, insulation, spray-on insulation. There are two types. One is the everything else, non-toxic or non-harmful, well, up to the point, because you still don't want to breathe any kind of dust. Or sometimes the spray-on insulation is going to be something that's called MMMF, triple MF. Oh. M, 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 F. Man made mineral fiber. It is pretty much just as dangerous as asbestos because it does have microscopic fibers and they can be inhaled. So that's why uh, there's a whole science behind that. You can get low exposure if it's just sprayed on and nobody disturbs it. You're considered to be uh, in a low exposure situation to the MMMF. Um, or if you disturb that, like for example, if you needed to disturb that to get to this ceiling, then you're in a high exposure situation. And then you have to wear all kinds of equipment as personal protective equipment. When you go to the job site, 
and you see that kind of stuff, a spray-on insulation, it, it's not here, it, but it's just spray-on insulation. Um, <clears throat> then you need to talk to the general contractor about that part. They should know that, because when the general contractor does the job, they do that type of assessment when they walk in. They should have the documentation on whether this thing is MMMF or this thing is not. And you can't tell just by looking at it, because it just looks just the same, whether it is MMMF insulation or is it something else that's not it. Uh, the only way to tell is just to take a little sample, send it to a lab, and uh, in the laboratory they uh, will be able to tell you that. But then, the general contractors, they do that, just that, and they will have paperwork, whether this is MMMF or not. It's not worth it just to say, okay, I'm just going to expose myself to that thing for about half an hour, 45 minutes. Well, you're going to be breathing that thing in for half an hour and 45 minutes, and the effects are not going to happen now. <clears throat> right? Later. When you forget, you actually have done that job years from now. So avoid that kind of stuff. But where we're talking about threaded rods. Another way, threaded rods and uh, ways of mounting them. So here's a rod hanger. Another part here is something that's called a drop anchor. A drop-in anchor, sorry. Weighted, uh, rated for uh, many pounds. So we can read that here. Of course, just because the anchor is rated for so many pounds weight, and that's rated for uh, like a lot, it doesn't mean the whole system is going to be because this this thing here can be rated for a lot of weight. But is the structure that this thing going into is is it that also? able to handle handles the whatever the weight you're going to put on so how th those are meant to be installed in the concrete situations you need to get a bigger drill hammer action drill uh, specialty type of drill bits for concrete and in the specifications of the threaded not the threaded the uh, drop in anchors because there are different sizes they will be specified the size of the drill bit that needs to be used for that particular one. This is just one of the examples that I got from somewhere. Yeah. How is that? Uh, okay, now, <clears throat> the hole should be drilled, and that anchor should be inserted that, and uh, these little tail end flaps should be expanded in order for that to be held in there. And then as you put in through, screw in the bolt, that is also going to expand those, uh, those wings here. And uh, it's going to be holding pretty darn good in the concrete wall or ceiling. Again, how are those mounted? Here's drill the hole, and you have to hammer that thing in. <coughs> And expand and there's attachment after drilling the hole you're gonna put in an attachment and you can use just a regular hammer and hammer that in or there are attachments for the big drills that uh, that it just they work on based on like a flippage you just flip the drill bit on the other side and insert that into that particular drop in anchor and just pull the trigger on the drill and uh, the hammer action is going to hammer that thing in. If you have to mount two or three of them, then fine, you can use that manual attachment uh, or manual gadget, insert that here and use the hammer to hammer that in. But if you have to mount like 200 or 500 of those, uh, day in, day out, then you're going to look for some other better ways of doing it, which would be the attachments for the hammer drills. So here's... the rod hanger here is drop in anchor <clears throat> you're talking about some heavier uh, things that need to be mounted and there's a chemical bond 
here's a side uh, it's kind of blurry here 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 and here that's a side of a cinder block a cinder block the bricks that uh, the big bricks that uh, the walls are made out of <clears throat> the bolt is being inserted and the chemical bond compound and quite often it comes in two parts the active part and the hardener and they're being mixed they have to be mixed and you know, usually one to one but you gotta read the package and those that compound is going to be injected in this opening where the bolt is inserted and quite often it's uh, about a day or two that they need to uh, just be left alone so the chemical compound has the time to set properly those are quite, those are really, really strong, strong. Um, it's like, you know, sometimes people call them chemical anchors. Um, these are the strongest ones. Um, better than this, better than that. All right. <clears throat> so three ways of mounting things. There are way more, but I'm going to use, I'm giving you some three basic ones. Now, it's 10 too. If you have to go, go. I'm going to continue recording and um, we might go a couple minutes over time. Then you can catch the end on YouTube when I post that uh, right after I record this, uh, this session here. Yeah. Yes, have a good weekend, Jay, and everybody here. Uh, thank you. Um, and I'll just continue and you can catch the end of it. Uh, it's been a blast. It was an awesome trip. We still have some labs that, that, uh, that we're going to see some of you. Um, but it was a beautiful, beautiful trip uh, since September till now. And hopefully I'm going to see you some way, somehow, somewhere. Okay, cool. Thank you for, it was a pleasure to work with you, all of you. All right, so um, I continue with this here. Rax. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. Hey, <laughs> thank you so it much. forever. <laughs> thank you. Good. Thank you, Bye -bye. thank you. All right. Um, yeah, that was nice. All right, racks, 19 inch racks, 19 inch. Here, from here to here, end to end is 19 inch. That's why they're called 19 inch racks. All the industrial pieces of, all the, all the equipment that is industri industry rated is pretty much equipped with the possibility of being mounted on a 19 inch rack horizontally and vertically <clears throat> so these here these holes are standardized and these distances are standardized you can see those in uh, our rooms b1007 b1009 in the soldering lab and some possibly other labs that uh, we have purchased some railings and mounted on something that's called the rack ears right here um, this PDU PDU stands for power distribution unit which is a glorified name for a well uh, extension cord uh, splitter right You see here this part. Oops. Yeah. These are called rack ears. Some of the professional amplifiers, audio amplifiers, they come with the rack ears attached permanently, eh, sort of. Uh, or they come with the rack ears packed separately and thrown into the box. So if you want to put the amplifier on the shelf you can but if you want to mount that amplifier in the rack then you attach those rack ears to the amplifier and you can mount them in the rack racks come the equipment racks come in different sizes and shapes this is like a portable floor standing rack on wheels of course it's 19 inch and it's specified for so many use like a letter u and the letter u stands for unit 
rack unit. See here, this PDU, this power distribution unit, is one U. This is one rack unit. This is how much it takes. Those oscilloscopes that we have in 1007 and 1009, <coughs> the rooms, I think there are four U's. They are much bigger. So it will take three or four U's. So it's a, you will see three U space, four U space, one U space. This is one U space. And just as you know, the power distribution units, the PDUs, they come in simple versions and sometimes they're a little bit more complex. There also exist ones that uh, are so called sequential PDU. What's a sequential PDU? When you turn it on, all of those outlets are not powered up at the same time. They are powered in sequence. One, two, three, four, and so on. In order to not create a sudden transient power surge. Because some of the equipment on power up, they take a transient hit. And they draw a lot of power so that uh, if it's uh, too much of it, then, well, the circuit breaker can react and open the circuit right so that's you know sometimes they power up all at once but if you need to you can order one that is sequential and uh, in those racks equipment can be mounted shelving can be mounted and whatnot now there are also loaded and unloaded remember loaded and unloaded patch panels, but they're also loaded and unloaded rack, sorry, the equipment rack rails. This rail can be attached to the wall of the, the uh, equipment rack, the casing, or it could be mounted straight onto the equipment, and if you, in, if you mount enough equipment on it, the whole thing by itself becomes a rack, right? Just look at B1007, B1009, that's exactly what we did. Right. We made a self-existing, self-perpetuating racks just out of rails. Right. Now, loaded, unloaded. Here's a thread, right here. There's a thread into which, of course, these screws, these are not to proportions, not to scale. These are called rack screws. They go in there. So this is loaded. It has those threaded holes. Or is it unloaded? Instead of having those, you're going to have cavities to which to which you can insert the clips. And these clips are going to accommodate the so-called rack screws. You can get rack. Notice you're not just any. Yes, you can find a proper thread and proper you know size of that and use it, but there's such thing as rack screws. The rack screws are those ones that are used in with the equipment racks. Okay. Here's an example of an unloaded wall-mounted rack. Pretty good. Here's an example of uh, enclosed. Floor standing racks. There are certain rules that things, you know, the racks in the land rooms, they need to be grounded and whatnot. They, you know, some of them are simple, some of them are swivel type, that uh, they have a mechanism that you can just swivel out, open on the hinges, the front part. So you can get to the back of the equipment. Some of them just mounted and that's it. You need to unscrew the equipment, pull it out. So certain type of way of dressing up the wiring you just gotta think about it uh, what do i need to do uh, in order to make the you know if we need to um, <laughs> if we <laughs> if we need to uh, i'm just i'm looking at the chat lines here uh, yeah Mikila, thank you uh, for the uh, yeah it was uh, it was a big trip a big trip awesome trip with uh, with all of you guys and gals um, so yeah, uh, and uh, you know, so the racks, types, and sizes, and thank you for using that 
own leather. Yeah, okay, there you go. <laughs> uh, I wonder if I can see it here. I wonder if you could see it or not. I just pulled the chat uh, on the main screen here. There's that little polish. Uh, own sound, okay. <laughs> All right. Like chausson in French or something like that. Okay? Chausson, does it mean anything? Grey Poupon. All right, okay, so... Uh, <clears throat> We've gone over this, we've gone over that, and that's the last slide. I'm going to leave this thing open-ended, just to symbolize the openness and the vastness of the... Michael, and the vastness of this... Um, uh, of this um, field. The infrastructure, so it goes with the electrical, with the pro-audio, with the data infrastructures, it's all connected. Yeah, thank you, Michael, as well. And Mikila, and Benjamin, and everybody. All right, and Jay. <laughs> um, so that's the last slide. And I will see you when I see you. Uh, don't be a stranger. Uh, as I always say, if you have an opportunity to start, or if you want to try starting your own business, or Take on a project to see if it's for you. Talk to me. I will direct you to every single step that you need to do to complete the project if you take it on. Hmm. All right. Love you guys, gals, and um, Dale. Hey. Oh yeah. I got. Yeah. You know, talk to me about that. Uh, those microphone cables. Uh, Dale and Jay, and uh, you can tell everyone what this is about. And if somebody else wants to do participate on that thing, I just want to show you how to connect uh, microphone cables. I'll be around. Uh, but uh, when I'm talking to Jay and Dale, it's because they are um, um, well in, in in actively participating in some sort of music activities, and um, that's what I want to show them. But if somebody else is interested, hey, more power join the party. One day we're going to have to go to the soldering lab and I'll show you how to solder microphone cables. But, please chase me after that. I, I, I might forget. <laughs> there we go. Alright. So that's it. Thank you very much. And uh, I will release the last test on um, probably Sunday night. And it's going to go through the whole week. And that's going to be it. Some of the makeup labs, uh, please check if you have those marks for the labs that you went to, went to. Make sure you're not missing any marks. Because we need to have all the labs completed. And the average mark for all the labs has to be greater than 50% in order to not fail the course. Uh, and, of course, the all the theory portion of that average, it has to average to 50% or more. And if both cases happen, then you're not failing the course or pretty much any other courses uh, in this program. All right, thank you. And uh, I'll see you when I see you. Mm, goodbye. Uh -huh.